it is a core and very essential part of language documentation because it is coming from the heart. It is coming from a very important kind of activity, which is a community-led activity. So it's not artificial. It's because what we do is always an experimental model, right? It's coming from more naturalistic data, and it is getting a lot of buy-in from the community because they care about that material. So what we have done in the past with the Lung Pong community is they have had writing workshops where they have worked with SIL. And we've used those materials as a springboard for, for looking at the stories, for kind of standardizing, and then doing analysis of those stories in our flex projects. So our documentation builds on their work and cycles back and then is contributed back to them as a corpus, both on our uh, digital our digital archive uh, um, competition resource for South Asian languages, or Corsal, um, and also now they can use it to make their own textbooks because they get the picture books with that. So you see how um, really finding out what the community is doing for documentation, calling it documentation, making it part of your project is a really important part of building your own goals because it can not only feed into the story books you can create the stories, but it can go into your collection project so you can understand the grammar and build your vocabulary collection more. So if something like Daniel's work happening, it seems like for some of us, if some of you are working in much smaller areas where the education level is in, for many of uh, us in the Northeast, when we work in the Northeast, education levels are very high, and community members are literate, and many people are reading and writing in English or in another language, and they can participate in, a, in, a, in an activity like this if we can teach them about it, or they may already be doing that. I just want to also point to this particular picture on the bottom here. Uh, also somebody that we know in common because you've been working uh, for him with both Beshot and with Rex. Rex is the son and Beshot is the father to the right of him. Uh, both of them are then just without any linguistic training really are very interested. The father in the middle has been recording folk songs and he's been recording folk tales and different rituals and Anything that he really found interesting, and as an elder, he knows really better what's being lost. He's recorded them and then put them on a there. And this thing he's holding in his hand is a transistor radio, and he figured people will like the transistor radio, so he's distributed them. But he snuck in the MP3 player with it and said, listen, why don't you also listen to our old stories? So he's doing his own documentation and his own dissemination with no help from us. And I think we need to find out what's going on and join forces with people like uh, Beshok Kuran. He's passed on his, his passion to his son, Rex. And Rex is very interested in agriculture and growing king chili. Like he wants to make sure that he understands a lot about the planting and so on of the Chandil region. So he's studying that. So what he does, and I'll show you this later on this afternoon. What he does is... He uses his phone, he takes pictures of different things and he sends them to us and he says, this is called this. This is how my grandma used to use this, this is how he used to wash our hair. This is how so different things in the, that he notices, he takes pictures of and he whatsapps it to us with detailed information. Get our 200 word list that somebody gives us and says, go and collect this. Okay, we get the word for chair and tree and the, but we don't get all of this detailed information of how is something made into a basket? How is they, how are things soaked in water? And what is the word for that water when it's poured off? And what is the container called activity that Rex sends me could have a total of 15 new concepts and maybe five new words. So if we're doing dictionary work, working with a community member to document their day-to-day -day lives would be a good way of increasing our, our, our methods, and this is what their goals are, about culture and language preservation. And, and our goals are, what are our goals? Because we could say we want that, but we also focus on language understanding and language understanding. Really, all those things come from the same source material, and I think that we can all collect that source material together. Um, I want to go to this one first, and we'll go backwards in a few minutes. So, members that I have been 
talking to don't ever really um, articulate is the cultural impact of documentation work on the community. I think they know it, but they don't, they haven't overtly, at least the people I've talked about, haven't overtly thought about it. But there is a, uh, some work that's been done in a more methodical way, looking at the correlation or correspondence between where language and culture has become part of the community, where it's important for everyday like education for, for kids, and the social well-being of the children. And the, the kinds of studies that have the studies came out because many people in for Native American languages, they would say, when our children are engaged in cultural and language activities, they do better at school. Or I see better, less dropout rates. Alcoholism seems to have gone down with young men when they're more involved in the cultural activities. So everyone was observing this, and they said, well, shouldn't we? some numbers that we can take it back to the government and say, let's do some more, it's good for us. So some people have, it's very, it's a, it's a kind of tricky thing and I think people are still studying it, but uh, some people have done some work um, in Canada, they have looked at the uh, suicide rates and the introduction of language and culture, looked at reduction, there was one spate of time when suicide rates had really risen, then they had a language and culture things being included, um, not because of that, but at the same time, and then they saw a decrease, uh, a decrease in the numbers of those suicides. Same thing with unhealthy habits that lead to diabetes. Um, there have been some studies done on diabetes rates going down when there's more cultural activities that are in the community. Communities in the U.S. have their languages really ripped out. Right? In India, it's a much slower process. They're not noticing it much because it's a very slow process. There's intermarriage few less speakers. There's COVID, few less speakers. Then kids are going to Hyderabad to go to school, or they're going to Laiola. There's few, so it's going very gradually, and they're not noticing it as much. So one of the things that would be helpful, I think, is in our documentation to bring that to the fore. But in other parts of the world, we have seen, in the US, in Canada, in Australia, that people are saying that for historical, tying people to their historical roots, Showing the the kind of celebrating their past and celebrating where they come from is very helpful to their physical well-being and their social well-being. And therefore, elders in those communities are working with archivists and linguists to document their languages. So purpose, goals, this is one of the purpose and goals that from the community seems to be um, seems to be important in coming up. And then of course these other ideas that come with it, like Oh, we're losing our traditional ecological knowledge. I don't know what this is called. I don't know how to do this healing ritual and so on. Or I'm forgetting what these plants are used for. Um, health and healing, the loss of, of verbal art and plays. Each of these things could be a summer school in itself because to adequately know how to document for traditional ecological knowledge, you have to have a botanist here, you have to have people who know about photography, people who have to know about herbariums and saving things, but um, these are definitely things that you see communities involved in with linguists for their language documentation projects, and some of them are doing it, doing it themselves. So um, those are some of the reasons I think that we can think of, and I would love to hear from you about you know, the communities that you've been working with. Do they care? Are they aware? If they are aware, what are they doing? their own language documentation. But this next slide starts our next next topic, which is one that you are more familiar with. You've seen this a lot of times. This I just pulled this off of the internet for of the National Science Foundation. Um, their solicitation for proposals. They ask people to submit proposals for working on uh, native language documentation. Now that program used to be called Documenting in Native Languages. And somebody decided that doesn't sound science enough. They changed it. They changed it to dynamic language infrastructure. Hello? I guess it's the same program. It is exactly almost the same program, but the focus now is on archiving, on big data, on computational methods, but it's still focusing on these languages that we don't know a lot about. 
but basically, I mean, we know we know these things. There are a lot of languages that are that many of them are understood the distinction, but the core fact is that they they've got this information in them. It creates an irreplaceable treasure that is for the communities to discuss as well as for humanity. And uh, we need to be able to get to that irreplaceable treasure. We need to have the methods that will get to them rather than skimming the surface. If in fact this is true, if you really believe it's true that every language has an irreplaceable treasure, the surface and get what is similar about all the languages and not dig deep and see what's the genius of each language. So we have to have methods that go both on the surface as well as dig deeper and get to each individual language as um, so forth. So um, this is one of the things that really moves both linguists, anthropologists, cognitive scientists, all of these people. They want to see also the differences between languages, for sure, but also the curious similarities between languages, right? So that's the whole idea of language universals and Cognitively, also, we're all human beings with brains, and we're all learning, and we're learning, and we're building cognitive systems. And but how is it that language might influence those those systems of thinking? So, cognitive scientists are also interested in language documentation. So that would be another purpose there. I think that's what I would like to discuss with you now. Just, um, of course, you're, you're you're very well aware of these these things like language school, language universals, and reconstructing language relatedness and so on. But the last one is what, I, what I'll deal with, because I think you know the other stuff pretty well. Maybe you know the last one, too, but that's, that's what I meant. So what I'm looking at now is this, this fact that everybody, no matter what culture you come from, you like to look at, um, you know, you, you need to express where things are located, right? All the time. Where's the teacup? It's on the table. Where are you going? I'm going across the street. So we're always telling people where things are, or where we're going, or where we are, and so on. But how do languages do that? Is it the same way, or are there different ways that it's done? And in fact, when we start looking at languages, we find some different patterns. And if we didn't, hadn't looked at languages, we wouldn't know there those different patterns. Um, so let's look at some, they seem to be these three main frames of reference, as they call them. So there's a relative, and absolute, and an intrinsic. When, when the relative, it's really um, from the you know the perspective of where the speaker is, so that I can you know, I can say that this frame, this screen is in front of me, and you will say it's it's back of it is in front of you, but the front of it is not, right? So um, and, and also this is a better one. I think that this one is to the right of me, but it's to the left of my rabbi is sitting. So that way, it's relative to where the speaker is. And in English, we can all it's to the left of me or to the right of me. But the really, uh, I think the cool one is this absolute frame of reference that you see in languages, like some of the Australian languages, like Unity, and it's written about quite a bit, where it's the cardinal directions that are used. So if you have, you know, if you have a snake with your feet picked here, you wouldn't say, hey, step away, there's a snake to the left of you. You say, step away, there's a snake to the east of you, or step away, east, west, or the south. They have, they, I think they have a picture of their directions. So they have this uh, cardinal directions, this, Kind of lined up with magnetic, but, but it's not, it's a little bit off and it has something to do with the, the tides and so on. But um, so they they have a northwest and south, and when they express a term of reference, they use this. So if you live in this community, you better know uh, where your north, south, east, and west are. I don't know how many of you know that for here. Do you know where north, south, east, west are? It's, um, the streets are sometimes called south, west, northwest, and so on. But not, many people don't know either. Don't you say like center of town or outside of town? You just don't. You don't use those things. Asking directions in India is very interesting. Like they say, when you go over there and you'll see that store, and then you just go like and you'll see that other picture. And <laughs> I, I always get lost. Yeah, I get lost. I want an address. Like what is the address? <laughs> but with GPS, it's a little bit better. But okay. So but for the Google Museum. They've got their GPS. Their GPS are these coordinates. And it is incorporated into the language. Um, there's another one that I will talk about just in a second, and that's the uphill and downhill axis. For many of you in the Northeast, uh, if you speak Aro, if you speak you know, any of the Chin languages, this is what is done. It's the uphill and downhill axis. And it's also a kind of absolute reference, because you're talking about something that is fixed on that kind of on that dimension. Um, okay. Then, uh, 
Yeah, then, you know, intrinsic is just like you've got uh, two different, you're not, the self does not involve this, uh, it's the actual items themselves and where they're located in relation to others. So in Bloomberg Unity, you'll see that this frame of reference is incorporated into the, uh, into the language with these kinds of, uh, they, they almost look like case markers, they've got the name of case marker, plot of an alias. So if you have uh, something that is to the east, that a uh, point, then that would be just a not form. If you say you're focusing east, if you're focusing on a rival point, then you say not a R. If it's east, but it's over some sort of hill or obstacle, then you have the not a And those are the different forms that you see, grammaticalized or grammaticized, to have this frame of reference that's been committed. Um, and in analyzing the grammar, you will see, you'll see uh, very clearly what those frames are. I just put that in there to show you that that happens. This is a whole kind of publication that you can also do. I like to show that it's a little bit there. Um, and here's a, the English tabletop frames of reference, which is slightly different. So if you wanted to really study the grammar, you would want to know that you can say something like uh, the fork is to the left of the spoon, but you would never say the spoon is to the north of the fork, or the spoon is, or the fork is to the north of the spoon. Those tiny, tiny things that are tabletop, you don't use north, south, east, west, but you can use it when you say the lake is to the north of the mountain. So what I'm just showing here is that you can have complex uh, forms that are taking some intrinsic and some some non to uh, some relative and some non to get the whole languages phrase of reference that are used. Uh, in the language Lampan and in other Tokichin languages, there are very complex verbs. And within those verbs, you can find a slot where you, if you want to think of morphology, that kind of slot and pillar model, um, where you find these directionals. So in the, in the third direction, so you've got agreement marking coming I mean, in the first two slots. In the middle slot, you've got these directionals. Then you get um, some more agreement. Then you've got the verb root. Then you've got some derivational markings that talk about intensity or uh, other kind of manner, you know, like how this was done. And then on more inflection, sometimes in some of the tenses, this will also be agreement marking that happens. So in this, you get these different choices of directionals that you can get. Uh, downward movement, upward movement. And the interesting thing about this is that people who speak these languages that they will say, well, did you know, and this is one of the things they want you to know about, because it is very salient and, and, and culturally important thing when you're expressing, come up for dinner, you have to have it up. Go down and get something, you have to have it down. People who don't speak the language natively will be misusing these or not knowing about them. So for us to know that there are actually three different ways of, of um, three different ways of actually using directionals for doing frames of reference, we had to do a deeper dive into these languages. And once we did that, we were able to say, oh, people don't do it all the same way, or some languages have complex forms. Uh, I won't spend more time on these, but I think that it's interesting to know that they have, uh, you know, this is very normal. This is something on an A, in the house A, and I'll use a directional. If I'm calling you and you're in D, I'll say, come down for dinner because you're up, and I know that, and from B, I'll say come up for dinner, and so on. Uh, C uses a different one. Okay? But what is interesting is these ones, the aristomorphic and anchors. This was a, a terminology developed by, at least the first time I've seen it was by Balthasar people to talk about the Biranti languages. And basically, um, this is what I've come to believe, and I'm, I, I, I need to understand more to make sure that I'm right about it, but we've asked in many different ways. And that is, if I'm in Chandel, and I need to go to Nepal, or I need to go to Delhi, uh, but Nepal is a better better example, I use a different kind of direction than if I'm going to another person's uh, house in another area of Chandel. So Chandel has a lot of hilly areas, and then it has some hilly areas that are even more hilly. Okay, so it's pretty much all of those. So when I'm going from one family to another for like a longer state, I may not have to use the going up. I may use the going level. But when I'm going up to a place like where the big guys live, like going to Nepal, then I have to say I'm going up. Coming down the hill and then going into the plane. 
Um, same thing like I'm going to Delhi or I'm going to London or to Maine, I tend to use the up. Uh, it doesn't have where I'm going and the permanency of where I'm going. So there's something, I don't think I have the whole story, but there's something going on there that has to do with the social position of the people who are involved in that movement. And so it, it is, um, it's very hard to get at like asking somebody because it's one of those things that Michael Silverstein called, you know, very low, very low on the accessibility, the, the cognitive accessibility of some things like tense an aspect, like something like this first morph, um, very good morphic anchors, like things like evidentiality. We cannot get to that by asking questions. We have to have the actual conversations so that we can have many of them come up with some predictions and then we can question them if we get it right. Do you think that this is what was said? Can I substitute this or this? But um, right now we haven't gotten that many and we need to get some more and we will be able to do that. Okay, so um, this is what I want to tell you about um, this part of my See, I don't think that I can keep going forever because it is seven five since I started. <laughs> and that clock is not working. Okay. All right. Um, so we, we can really, uh, as scientists, we can really think a lot about how we're learning more about cognition and about diversity, cognitive diversity, um, and how it relates to language. Is, it really, is there really differences in the way people frame things and understand things? If I change the language, if they change the way they understand it, you see kind of work in study that could be done. But um, also, many of you in societies where there are younger children learning the language, so this would be interesting to see how are younger children acquiring these frames of reference. There's a lot that could be done. Okay, let me take a deep breath and move to another social science thing, unless you want to say something. Iowa? But, 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 but it's kind of uh, what is interesting is, like you said, it's not going to be an easy task, like the and all this stuff to uh, have a parametric volume to actually access this information easily. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, to have a uh, yeah. Or to be able to actually model it to have a question based. Yeah. Do you think is it, would it be possible to actually do that? But because even, uh, even now, internationality is the area that uh, people are still working on, they're doing the questionnaires and they have the models on which I it, uh, coming to a prescriptive mod, a uh, move of yeah. listing. So I think just one step above the, the questionnaire model would do it. That questionnaire model was uh, trying to get a slight, a small story which had used, which uses more movement. So that you can use something like the last one, the one that has their first page book, but um, that again is not really connected. You show a picture and you ask somebody to describe what's happening in that picture. So it would be interesting, I think, to build a, a version, something like a pair story, which even shorter could do it. And, see what kind of results you can get, you can get there. Um, another thing that would be interesting to do is to have a small video that's done, um, have a description that's done, and then mess it up. They change all the things around, and then work with somebody to see how they would actually put it, or have a mix and match. Like, where should I, where should, which So everything is set, the only thing that's missing are those position markers in the pattern. But you have to start with the prompt being something natural, and then you build a short story of some sort. That's how I would like to proceed on my next stage. What we've done so far is mostly with orally saying, so what if I was going to Delhi, and I don't know, what do you think I would do? And it's still that very kind of interviewing, interviewing on steroids, but it's still interviewing. <laughs> so we need a little bit more, I think, of this. So then I, if I could get 20 or 30 of those, then I could also test accuracy because I could see, am I affecting the data the way I'm asking, or am I getting reliable data, and so on. So I would like to also increase the number of the control 
it's local institutions. That's, that's what I would do. Um, in my next life, or maybe after I retire. Okay, so let me go on to. Hello? Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, please. Yeah, so I think at the point yeah, when you were talking about this case or the accident with the person. I think there is a question of grammatical license. Sometimes I think you have a feeling over there. See, when I say up, up is socio economically in a little bit higher part. A, people, a person from the far is supposed to be respected by the people from the south side. Then when somebody sees him, oh, he's from upside. He's from upside. So kinds of you know, directionality stays a little bit related to the grammatical license process. That's why you don't say, when we say Manipuri, for example, as your records, because you give one on me. So when I say, Satha, Tha is down, not in, so I go, so down, not, but when we use it in the grammatical life, it's such a, it gives the sense of continuity. I'm, I'm still working on it. We are progressing in time. I said, very when I say, not I'm going down. So is it other, some kind of other really levels, like now coming to Satha, something related to that. I think that some of these uh, work very slowly, like when you're giving somebody something, you know how in my you say, you say, you say, you have something like that, you have a little bit of extra for making it more polite. Right? Yeah. Hard to not pronounce it. Bad, but, uh, so, um, there's something similar in, in Lampang, when you say to give, you say, uh, you have that uh, you or you, which is like downward or upward, so you, you give somebody, but you give it with the downward or the upward, so it, it, it has an extra politeness or benefactor kind of reading to it. So something is happening with those directionals that has some extra meaning, as you're saying, cut and singe and uh, all of those, yeah, ha uh, and singe. Because it's very difficult for people who are going to have one class in here, so Yeah. Because like not like in English, so for English something like quotation, destruction, they have but in, in different verbal languages, all these relationality markers of both kinds of They have extended in some meaning. Yes. Yeah, that in itself would be really interesting. And I think Dijane did something on this on in um, in the last Tibiani uh, thing that they collected a whole bunch of things with the her or one of them and show the meanings that that would be very interesting, interesting kind of work, especially with native speaking linguists. They're, they're the ones who can really get, get at all these kind of nuances. Yeah. Up to now. This, this side has to ask. They already have two questions. So by the end, I hope one of you ask. Okay, let's go on to this. Um, and I'll try to do it, you know, not spend too long on it. But, but, but one of the projects that I'm working on with some of my, my colleagues at my university, they're both, um, I guess they're both from the U.S., they're political scientists, and uh, they've actually come to India, and they came to Gauhati, uh, they came to Gauhati and uh, they're interested in peace and reconciliation. And so I uh, started talking to them about um, the fact that many languages become endangered because they are areas of political instability whether it is low-level violence or higher-level violence. So um, now we see, of course, you know, in the Ukraine, people are leaving in dozens, and we don't know if the children there will ever learn Ukrainian, they may learn Russian, they may learn English, they may not learn Ukrainian. So that's a very good example of what I mean there. And so I asked, uh, so should we get together, I asked political science colleagues, and do something together on how you guys study language and how it influences political instability or is influenced by, and how we as language documenters do the same because all of us are very small communities, many of which have undergone uh, political instability and their languages are in danger because of it. That was where I saw the two things coming together. And so what we did was we brought a whole bunch of political scientists together and linguists together, and many of them were not interested. They had no clue what we were talking about. We had a core group that was interested, and we got together and started looking at this. And from that, we had some papers that came up. Harvey Starr is a very well-known political scientist, and he was teaching us, and he said the reason why political scientists are interested in languages is because in their science, they want to be able to categorize or make categories of political conduct. They need to have 
these categories so that when they see political conflict, they can say, okay, it falls under this category. Okay, so they need to understand it better. And to get those typologies, they need to know what's out there. And so they go to communities and they try to understand, okay, why did this conflict happen? What are the factors? And then they could add it to their typologies. And then they use the to arrive at their, you know, we have our generalizations that are theorizing, they have theirs. They need to do that. And so here are some examples of the types of conflict that come up. So uh, I, I'll, let me do the first two and then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, leave it to you to ask later if you're interested in the rest of them. But this is an example. So the first is supposing there is a dominant group and it settles where a minority group is, it takes its, it, its uh, land away. This would be called one kind of typology of conflict for their indigenous minorities. Or uh, people have to move because the borders are shifted or there's war, um, and then this would be called a geopolitical minority, and so on. So these things on the left-hand side of the Poland are the typologies of conflict. You don't have to worry about it except to say they are trying to figure something out, and they need to understand what's happening in these communities. And that is something that we as language documenters can offer this social science because we have a unique view into these this does what the point this morning my talk was to talk about the goals of language documentation. So some of the things that political scientists are asking with, after they create those things is what is the root cause of ethnic conflict? Um, sometimes people say, well, time immemorial, that was a primordial one. We have always been at you know at conflict with such and such a group. Or is it something that was whipped up because you know one group wanted to grab land or something? So there would be a cause of ethnic conflict. And refining their definitions, and the, these are the kinds of things we're concerned with. And what they found actually was that language was one of the most important factors linked to national identity, and there also when national identity was conflicted or when there was some when the conflict was related to that, it became one of the core reasons for for conflict. So they language for this reason, but. Um, and if you want my slides, too, I'm happy to share them with you, so um, you, can, you can take them for what they're worth. But I, I'm hoping that we can also uh, have more publications out. We have one publication out specifically on language documentation and political instability in the journal Language Documentation and Conservation. It's open access, so you can just type my name in and you can get all uh, much of this material. So, uh, these are the kinds of things that they want to know. Uh, how does language and violent political violence and post conflict peace building, how can we prevent violence from happening? Is there a way that language can be used as a vehicle for good and so on? But one of the things that's really interesting, I think that we should probably go to this slide, is that the way they get their data, so they really care about language. This, that, that I've already think I've established. But the way they get their data is Interesting. I don't know if you knew this. I did not know this. Political scientists, I've heard now, is that they get their data through large end databases. So how are those databases created? They're created. There are two ways. Numbers. I'm losing my words here, but not things that are collected through surveys. Things that are collected through, say, the the Department of who would collect it? The Department of uh, Social. Census, census. Who are our surveys? Uh, did I put it down here? So some big department, governmental department, they call them the elites. They get their, their um, uh, government sources, the elites, the academics that are collecting information through things like surveys. And then these are put into the kinds of data that they get are very broad based. They're not micro like ours. They have to do with how many conflicts were there, um, how many people were lost, very, very much like what year was it, what place was it, it's, it's very, very broad based. And then they try to put it all into a database and have people who are working on programs to standardize that so that they can compare across different, <coughs> different countries. And this is one example of one of the of war, and a lot of people contribute to that. So that's one kind. The second kind of database we have is a little bit better in that it gets to what people actually think that it comes from newspapers. Uh, newspapers and they look at individual um, events that happen. So here is this small battle, here is this particular uh, inter-ethnic conflict that was reported in the newspaper. Okay. So 
they are doing very important work that matters to all of us on the basis of it. But their data is coming from two sources. One is reported from large collection of people who have never been to that place probably, but they've collected some sort of survey data. And secondly, from newspapers. Those of you who are from the Northeast here, I've heard so many times, this is never recorded in the newspapers. Most of the things that people experience in smaller communities does not make it to the newspaper, or if it does, it's like four lines. So and so, nothing, no story about what it was, no personal story or anything. But if we could ask, if we could know the what and the why, they would need better qualitative data that go along with this quantitative data, and they would need it at a sub-national or local level. And so that's what I thought was a really good time for us as language documenters. Yes, we're documenting language because we love language, we love linguistics, we want to figure out the nuts and bolts, uh, we want to do our computational work, we want to build our dictionaries, but there's also a way that our own science can become more valued in social science. Many people don't know what we do, we don't think that we're doing anything important, but if we can combine forces with political scientists or other social scientists, we can show the value of what we're doing. And here's a great, uh, great set of people that we can work with. So when we record audio and video, when we create translations, transcriptions, do our descriptions, do our archiving, we can keep in mind that we are not the only people using that work for building descriptions, but it could be, could have a larger purpose. And so our data formats, our metadata, um, our search engines could then find and be able to use, use these things. So uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, but I wanted to say that there are certain types of that are not invasive. There are some ethical concerns, we'll discuss that tomorrow, but the kinds of them would be basically personal stories. There would be people telling their life history, but they would be asked in a non-confrontational way of what was life like for you then, what is it like for you now? And that then and now question seems to bring up a lot of this history, whether it is whether it is detailed or not. I used to live in this village, now I live here because you know we have to leave our village. That's it, they don't say anything else. Or the other person says, I live here because I used to live there, but then my whole family was killed and I had to leave that village. So people are different in the way they express it. The way they can deal with the trauma is different. And so you as a linguist, you don't have training of dealing with traumatic experiences and how people should talk about that. So this is something that I think we could do in the future as documenters, but I think we would need to have uh, some social, social workers with us who would need to learn about trauma narratives and so on. But asking a simple question like, what was it like then and now, is something that could get you a personal narrative that could be added to this kind of database in a, in a non in a, in a relatively non way. Um, and I'm coming to the close of this. I just want to tell you that I uh, we, we went to um, the Smithsonian and we presented this material. Then we also went to uh, ICNCA in Delhi slash UNESCO with a combined on the 2020 before the pandemic broke. And I invited several people to come from the Northeast. We had um, Sushma Kim come, but she gave us you know, her information for the Smithsonian one. But Paul Tan Hagib, um, Chante, Marjane Mayanabam, and um, uh, Somi Roy. So all of these people came and they talked about this question, language then and language now. And they uh, were able, in their talking about it, you could find those pieces that would be interesting to political scientists, as well as interesting to us as linguists. We need to share a little bit about that and then we will questions. So Sushro talked a lot about the fact that in the past, you know, Lampang was spoken in, in home, in church, everywhere, and then because of, of intermarriage and other things that it has not been spoken that much um, by a certain, so kids are still speaking in younger ones, but if you look at people who are in their teens or a little bit older, they have met, many times have had to leave uh, the state to get their education. So they're speaking it, but a lot less than they used to speak it. So she talks about, she talks about that then and now. And um, they also talk about how younger kids in, uh, let's say, 50 
talk about games, like the kids on the bottom there, they developed, they put together these wooden you kind know, of scooters, and there's a name for it in Lam I forget. I've already done some of that. Well, let's put the caption on that picture, and I can't read it. But they used to know about those 15 years ago, and now they don't do that anymore. Now the kids are not, are not really, um, so they were able to talk about and now and what's being, what's being lost and why. Um, And I will tell you just about these two guys, and then I will then stop there. So, um, Anna Rochelle came and spoke. She's from my university, and she grew up in uh, Bosnia, and she talked about the um, siege of Sarajevo and how um, it was totally related to language because there was a like, burning of all the books there. And immediately after that, we had marching talk. So, you know, we, we have a, a, a landmark um, event in Manipur as well for the main days where there was a burning of books and people felt that like some of their culture was, was being lost at that point. And she, um, so right after that march, we did talk, and I thought it was so interesting because the language that now, because he was the youngest person in our whole workshop, in a large workshop that's part of it, uh, and he talked about, because he plays the piano, and his father is also a professional player, and his family kind of artistry thing, and he was talking about the fact, not making any kind of political comment at all, but from his personal perspective of wanting to understand the art of the Pina, that it was being something that he couldn't access anymore. And this is something that you can only get with this personal kind of conversation, or individual narration, to understand the, the whole kind of ecology of language loss and where it happens. Hung, he talked about her father, and said very importantly that Often the stories are just not told. There was no one to report it. She talks way back and forth at the time of the British happening with the relocation of villages there. Um, and then I also have already shared the story of, of Rex. He was also a speaker there. Um, and then Halman was talking about the different Pala villages and how they are situated right now and are pretty protected, but a slight change in the land could open it up so that they will not be able to communicate with each other and that there would be a loss of language. Awareness also seems to be a very point that people don't realize that she is not. So, okay, we are talking about the reasons Documentation. We started out and said communities really want to preserve their traditional knowledge and pass that down. The second thing we said was that linguists, often cognitive scientists, want to know more about how languages represent the way people think about their environment. And so it's very useful to do a deep dive and look at different things like reference. And this was the last one that I would put, which is, has to do with other social sciences. That other social sciences need linguistic data from the uh, aspect of personal personal narratives, because they want to understand what's happening on the ground, and not just numbers and things from newspapers where these things may not be represented. So language documentation, if we can collect first-person narratives, these would be equally important for things like the study of conflict, but also for things like study of ecological change. I just put in a proposal, and I'm waiting every day to see if I'm going to get declined. So every morning, I get my phone out and I say, have I gotten the decline yet? <laughs> Not, have they given me the project given? I'm expecting the decline. But the proposal was to use, uh, use first person narratives to get at ecological change for the long run as they moved from uh, the hills in Charlong to Chandel district, where in Palel, to move to Palel, and they've lost that hilly terrain and to see how that is really affected their language as they now actually intend to go back and, and pilot some of the linear abilities up in the hills. So first person narratives are very important for ecological change as well as, as this. And I hope that we can uh, improve what we do in our documentation work to, to be able to tell the story that's not told. And this will help all of you who don't care. And maybe some of you said like, how do I get involved? It's too touchy, it's too political. But actually every kind of connection can then help your syntax. It can help your morphology study and, and so on. And we can talk more about that um, about that tomorrow. We will get more on how we can help by our our grand building. So language documentation methodologies that we use are important for other sciences. And I put this here. All right. Well,
Well, thank you very much for your attention, and I think you can... In your concluding session, you have heard when you conclude the last two minutes. So why do you use and told untrue story to the information? Is there any reason behind this? In your concluding, concluding remark. Okay. Yes. Tell the story that is not told. Right. Please explain. Okay. Else. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, when and it's a great opening. So when uh, when we go as linguists and visit communities, we're often very much interested in like we have to finish our dissertations, we have to get our project done, and we go in and get the data that we need to be. But what we're missing is that there are many people there who have experienced things that are of very huge interest, both in terms of for people who are doing. Uh, ecological study, like flora, fauna, environmental change, and so on. We're going to study like social political climate. The stories are there. There, the personal stories that are there have never been told to anybody. Actually, one lady that we um, we went to stay with Sufjo's relatives in Nepal, and we were not. Might have been referred to what you're saying. So he started talking about it and his very experience in having a cheap child. She said, No one has ever asked me this before. It's the first time I've been able to tell anyone. That was very sad because it's like she's been carrying that trauma around. But also, we don't know the details. That's what I mean. This, this is the story. It's not told. And it's not bad stuff. It's also the good stuff. Like the amazing kinds of stories that are there. The uh, rituals or the joyous festivals like the Totlam Punk Festival where they have a bitum and they've got whole you know grease poles and they're going up and down. There's just so much that's going on in the rest of the world that we know about. So that's what I mean. It's a story that's not Thank you. Uh, my question is, like, uh, you know, suppose if one goes in the field for a research project, a language documentation project, uh, as a principal investigator, how does one uh, identi uh, identify and recruit uh, community members uh, involved, in, like, uh, to facilitate the language documentation project? Perspective. And also, could you share your experiences uh, with the Manipuri uh, community, or with the Manipuri as well as the Lansom community, in identifying and recruiting uh, possible um, uh, possible participants in the project? I think that you know, I could, I would love to talk to you about this some more because it may be our, a time for us to redo our paradigm of how we do this. Uh, because in the past, it was very much. I decide, you know, we have a list of languages and we decide we need to go and work on those. Like, we visit the community and say we would like to work with your... This may not work in the future because, one thing, there may actually be another list that could be curated. A list where there are already language documenters working in those communities. And it may really be helpful then to change how I choose my language. Which is basically to have a series, like this kind of workshop is fantastic for us, but to also have, for, and I know it's been done, I, I'm not saying it's not been done, but it would be really nice to have regular workshops where we bring those documenters in and see where they're at. 
doing, how are you doing, how can we, how can we support it? That's a slightly different way because they're already working and we are offering support for what they're doing. The amazing thing that's happening now, of course, is more things to get, but that's what I know most of all of the native speaking linguists, and the, some of them are right here, sliders, we can really be partners with the native speaking, very different way of approaching the whole thing. Um, yeah, Lampa, right? And identifying. I really didn't do any of that work myself. It was really uh, um, Peshot and Rex who first came to me through my friend Hari Won Anajan, who is a graduate from my Korean University MA. And he worked with me when I was working on my mind for stuff. And but then he did his PhD on Lam Tan. They were neighbors, Peshot's family and, and uh, Hari Won's family. So they came to me, they came to Chennai, and they said, Can you help us? So it was really very organic, and then they identified uh, when we held our workshops. I said, "Who should we call?" In that sense, I was not being a gatekeeper, but certainly they were because they were selecting the people that come. It would be ideal if I could now travel to each of the individual villages and just be able to. The Demasa are doing that right now. They're going to all of the different villages and telling them what they're working on and asking them. So that would be awesome. Right? And that's possible because Manali is the Masa herself, right? right? So that the, the native speaking linguists are the ones that can help with that. Uh, I suppose uh, if uh, like no sibling group is or has been that by the community, uh, uh, because uh, you know you remember last year you know saying that uh, you know, you know, communities in the northeast part of India and involved uh, in terms of community-based uh, uh, language uh, documentation or evangelization programs, even though they are uh, specifically trained in this, but they have eager and will to move. If, if, if there's no uh, like significant work being done or, or no awareness at all for their language, so how does one identify and the factors involved in identifying the uh, potential uh, 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 collaborators on a particular research documentation research project here? So, I mean, can we discuss that and then, you know, so by the way, there's a great and a lot of work going there, like how long there are differences. Where did it come from? One of the gals working in parallel with the Nazi said that, you know, what about what about your, you know, what about this? Where the community has been really close enough and COVID, and how do we get to identify who's going to be people that you work with? So, our young people are more enthusiastic and like they are more of an issue. Why are we interested in the project? I don't think so. I mean, I don't think we definitely call that game. It's the same factor. I was like, it's the same factor and the enthusiasm, enthusiasm for their language are really a, a, a matter of, of, of factor for their involvement. I don't think so. I don't think that that's actually happened. Maybe the, in terms of use of technology, the people that you're working with, has to do with 
getting to know the people and, and getting to spend some time there and just encouraging them to like on the phone. So supposing nobody's doing it yet. I want to talk later on about using WhatsApp as a tool for collection. What if my goal was really to connect with them and to just show them that they would use WhatsApp for collecting ecological information in their communities and then showing them how to create it and put it into a dictionary? So they don't know what the is. They don't, they don't have anybody that was working on it anyway. But if you can show them how to use a phone, you may need to get some money from, you know, the money people. <laughs> To buy some phones, because a lot of people only have good phones still. But even two or three good phones with data that's provided in the community would then increase their interest, and then you've got your in. So, but your dissertation may end up being about that process rather than I read the history of the grammar. Um, I don't know, we have to do something to shape things up now because we come to this position where we're, we're saying, well, we're imposing on people they're not really interested. So, you're welcome to disagree with everything that I'm saying. I'm just, I'm not in your position. I'm not walking in your shoes. I don't know all the facts. You have to tell me that's nonsense. It's not going to work. Or you can tell me the funders will never agree to it. Or this is how we've done it. But I would like to hear from you. If we don't say wild things, then we'll never move forward. So I'm just saying something like, uh, yeah, let's, let's think about a different way. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. This is a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my question would be possibly controversial. I want to talk about this uh, political science collecting the data in the native languages. And nowadays, where the social media is so openly available and uh, sentimental analysis is what? Fetching the data. And uh, I would rather say, going a step further, is not just fetching the data, it is creating the data. So, how do you think that would impact the whole uh, linguistic data connection? So, uh, so you're talking about the existence of social media. Are you connecting it to the source that one collect? A uh, separate, separate kind of idea, right? Partially, that is also happening. I mean, the way I have observed myself, um, there are certain posts which are posted under the groups, and it, it is containing such uh, such data which invoke people to. Uh, you know, pour out their own feelings. Yeah. So those that may be uh, containing some sensitive data as well, which is not available. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, so okay, let's let's uh, let's just very briefly discuss. Like, so um, I want to say that we really don't know how this should happen because of the word sensitive data. Right? We don't want to put people at risk. We don't want to do this in sight. We don't want to do this in a way that's going to be the wrong way to do it. So I don't think we have had enough meetings between us linguists and other people to figure out exactly how to do this. So we know that we want to do it, but we don't know exactly how to use these first-person narratives in, a, in an ethical and safe way. That's one, that's one issue. Um, the idea of social media to evoke responses, um, again, it could go arrive because it is such a like, a lot of people will identify themselves but if you're on twitter and you have a handle that you know who you are you can say things that are inaccurate you can say things that are that are um, inciting so social media abuse is is a is something to be careful about however we have found that um, you can link people to existing corpora where you collected things like on our own parcel, we have collections like it's made by the Lampam, and uh, Rex has been working on the Facebook page for the parcel, and he will occasionally, he tries to do it every month, he will occasionally post there to bring people to the collection and say, hey, have you noticed this weaving pattern? Or when you looked at this story, to get them talking about it. So I think that for at least for ecological knowledge, that would be one very good use of social media to actually post things and get the group 
discussing or saying that's not what it's called, but this is not how we use it, this is how we use it, and so on. But the political science thing, that's a little bit more that's a little bit more touchy and needs a lot more discussion on how to do social media use. I think the but first person narratives, if I collect them and I can then make a rule for myself, these are the ones that can be exposed, these are the ones that need to be quarantined and not exposed because they're very sensitive then I would be able to use at least some snippets or some some things in my reporting about being able to tell the story. So yeah, it's a it's a very, it's a very good question and very scary. You know, you could go along very quickly. So we don't want to do it without more more thought. I'm not um, that was very insightful. I'm um, I'm um, Priyanka. I just introduced myself to the world. I thought it was So, man, there are a lot of things uh, that are forest dwellers. So, um, there has been this situation the political situation where they have been linked to the limited uh, organizations. And uh, that I think there have been studies in Odisha where the militant organizations have taken an effort to learn their language to increase their bonding with the forest dwellers, uh, the community members, rather than the government ad administrators. So um, right now, they are putting it as a fieldwork restriction stating the reason that this could be a member of the militant organization who is trying to get to know the language so they, for their own ulterior motives uh, rather than for the purpose of language documentation. And they've put on hold on the fact that we can't take video recordings of the people there uh, and and rather just stick to the audio recordings or minimal documentation and the government is currently not providing enough resources to develop the language documentation processes also. So how do we navigate in this situation as a, as a field work linguist? Yeah, okay. I'm only making notes because I don't really have not thought about this very complicated situation. Because it seems like one, it was like you could not gain access yourself because now it's really close. Maybe it'll open up some kind of, but it does open up you cannot do video or audio. And there may be other restrictions based on whatever the government is able to see. They want to avoid certain, like you were talking about certain possible things to do with training or equivalency and so on. So um, it seems, again, if, because these are forest dwellers and you're not really sure what their, what their feelings are about loss of language, right? You don't know. You're really not aware. Is there no contact person? At all that you have, I mean, just no one person that you can that you're working with. I do have one contact person. Uh, the person is a community member who has become a teacher there in Sahara. Uh, but they tend to uh, favorite the dominant language and try to uh, find similarities with the dominant language and suppress the uniqueness of, of, sure. the, of the community's language. So Is there it, I'm finding a difficulty as well. Yeah, it happens with some of the social more training here, there's a little stigma and they will avoid it. So let me, let me not, let me go one step more positive from yours and then move back into that, that area, right? So supposing I am working with some forest dwellers and I, I have at least one or two people who are interested. One of the things that people have been doing in communities where it's been difficult to get people interested, not to go and study them, but to get them interested in studying for themselves, is that they have um, gotten surveys that the community themselves have developed. So they can be oral surveys, they can be written surveys, obviously in the state of actual oral surveys, asking a number of questions build awareness that there may be a danger that the language is being lost. And the, the, there are often times community 
meetings of all different sorts, whether they're religious or they have to do with adjudicating some conflict or whatever. But there's some place where these kinds of questions can come up. There's an outside, they, they, would, they could say, an outsider has come here, we've got a few questions that we want to think about. Uh, they're not asking us for anything, they're just asking us to think about these things. These survey questions, especially when they're community developed, usually when we keep the questions in the survey, the, the community will say, I'm, I'm talking about Native American communities where they've tried this. They will say, well, those are not the right questions. We want to ask them this way. So they develop like a bank of five or six questions, and then I'm being filled by it. <laughs> I see. <laughs> uh, so then, then they're, they're, uh, they, those surveys have been very useful in raising awareness, and then, then, to say, this is bad, we didn't realize it, and that sort of sets the ball rolling. So that's one, one thing I just want to bring to your attention is um, the usefulness of surveys for language revitalization. And once then language revitalization becomes a question, then it can be what well, don't we set the work of the new dictionary? It would be good for us to have a base grammar for you to be able to have textbooks and so on. But I wonder why you also so you were saying that the children are taken out and they're in government schools. And so at that point for mother tongue education, could that be a road as well to build you know, to be able to build some basics? You guys know a lot more about this than I do, so I would be curious to know that mother tongue education would be a way to say we as linguists can help with building some of those basic tools that this is what would be necessary to build. I just want to add which which area you are particularly speaking in Odisha? This is the Cholanakim tribe in Kerala. Oh Kerala, okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, no, that's I, what you're talking with. I, I, it's all new to me. Yeah. What you're talking Even about. I'm very cool. I want to get any more ideas. Yeah. 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 Anybody else have ideas about uh, this particular case? I would love to also learn more about if possible. Okay. Language documentation and the goals and purposes. Directly, yeah, from our team. I mean, I'm now confused. Did you mention the word Odisha? Set this as an example okay, okay. where the military organizations have taken an effort to learn the okay. community language. So, uh, in case of Odisha, uh, like uh, spare time, they have visited uh, last time 2018, there was no much, not much problem. Okay. But Kerala, I'm sure, as you were saying, there was not a problem. I don't know about other parts of India, but in Kerala, uh, a lot of tribes did uh, this community decision of I think it's called Uri Chair or something. And um, they decided that for their own benefit of, uh, you know, for upkeeping the health, that they won't allow outsiders into the community. And uh, the local administrators, government administrators, are also supportive of this decision. Uh, there has been cases in Kerala where uh, people under the pretext of making a documentary in the Elamakudi uh, district. That's like a tribal district in Kerala. So the documentary people went inside and cases were reported, corona cases. And that's when they put on all these few work restrictions. Most of the sense. Yeah, we have to be very, I, I think, yeah. 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 Decisions because in the end there will be no uptake for whatever you provide. So if you want your work to be useful and useful for the large number of people, you need to be working with people who actually are going to be able to use the things that they've already decided that it's not something that they want done. In any case, then not only are you violating their wishes, then you're also 
spending your time working on something that ultimately is not going to be helpful because I think that it's going to happen very soon where I think any publication like Tamilian Linguistics or Linguistics of the Tibetan Urban Area will not uh, publish things. I'm talking for Northeasting and I guess that they will not uh, publish things that don't have the textual information that to back them up. Like where are the texts that you have to if it's only done with things that you've elicited very quickly and rapidly come out. Uh, even as a scientist, this will not be useful for you. So it's almost like, aren't there enough languages where the communities are open that um, we could be doing the detailed documentation there, but for those places where it's not open, we could be doing more anthropological or other kinds of work. I'm not sure the and this has been a language that has not been featured in any linguistic resources whether it be like uh, ethnologue or glottologue or, or even our SP skill um, so I think before a language dies out I, I as a linguist can help with the documentation project with all my knowledge so that was the motivation yeah. and I was hoping for insights with the technology so the, I think we need at least a small unit, somebody who you can train with WhatsApp, somebody you can train with surveys. It has to be something, some way you can get it, maybe your school teacher is the one that we can, if we can talk about how to curb this prescriptivism and encourage it. Hello.
If you want to be a field linguist, and particularly in India and in conflict zones, I think these are some of the things that yeah, we will have to. We have to. Yeah, we will have to find a way around this. But there's uh, there's no exact solution to this. There's no one person who can go and yeah, will solve your problem. Or this has to be mediated around. Yeah, we have to find a way around this. That's the only way I can say that. Yeah. I still remember uh, Sikkim. Well, I was in the border. Um, bordering uh, West Bengal, where the Darjeeling, when the Darjeeling contract was going on. So the ID reported that there okay, were two people from North East is collecting data. So I had to go to the police station, yeah, more than once or twice. But, uh, so, but at the end of it, if you do have your thing in order, I don't think uh, any major harm <laughs> that's come across. But yeah, uh, the point of access that you, uh, the difficulty that you Basically. We have to navigate around that. We have to find a way. So, but I think that's a valid point that yeah, we, when we have people around, we can actually find ways around that. I still remember, yeah. Um, so, Niti, Niti Valley. So, that's the last border in um, Indian town uh, that borders Tibet. Again, same thing. So we, uh, if we have to go there, we have to get yeah, permission. So, it, so one vehicle will come to Joshima, pick you up, right? So that's the one village. Uh, that one guy will start at five thirty in the morning from the village, right? So that's only what. That's the only way of commute that was available to us. So these are things that you have to do. You have to yeah, travel. And yeah, you have to find a way. That's what, as researchers, we have to do. That's okay. By the way, I have to always report to CIP and I cover my Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not just yet, yeah, like you said. Yeah. Even uh, we, as uh, yeah, uh, you, you say uh, from whichever part we are, but it's at certain locations we need to have yeah, uh, passes. We need to create passes, and yeah, we need to have. Documentation. So it's part and parcel of the yeah, documentation working with smaller, lesser, endangered languages come to the territory. So we have to be. Yeah. It's not. I can understand your yeah situation. It's not. Uh, you're not in a documentation project. You are doing your PhD. You have time to certain implementations and all of that. But yeah, part and parcel of working with lesser and endangered languages. But all the best to you. Yeah. I just want to add something. See, uh, as a researcher or student, you always want a very easy access. And that easy access is not possible. Think about the officer or the concern section. They have to follow something. Okay. Let's say, I mean, if they don't follow and something happens, the common people is going to blame that officer. So I need to, uh, I think we should follow the rules. I mean, sometimes it's problem meeting like your case. Okay, uh, and we'll go ahead and we should always like, I am very much aware of Jennifer case, it's too much time actually. I have to call here and there. It's okay, but they have to follow that. But you can't imagine, okay, first day I am going, I get the access, that is not going to happen. When you, you will not allow outsider at your home in one day, how come they will allow you in the community? Uh, just to share uh, some more experience actually. Uh, someone said that like, you know, working with the communities from northeastern uh, region is uh, like, you know, too fun, like you know, they are going to just like, you know, they will literally keep it at you know. Let me tell you the other side of the story. There are places where you have only single vehicle and you are on the way, the vehicle uh, not stop functioning, you are of your own, nobody cares actually. I traveled around 25 kilometers, but nothing was available. It's like deep inside the jungle, you have to, uh, you know, go. This student stayed. 
Pero eso es algo que es una gran entrada, voy a preguntar que me que se debe decir que la onda, no me explico, de que me sample su sé, y esta fue para la parte de Q, para la parte de un ofrendo, y va a Q, la de los dos de Bon, y que no me voy a contar. So there are places uh, which might take around, say, 14, 15 hours to reach there. And then, you know, you cannot finish your work and come back because there is nothing available. You have to actually stay with them. So developing rapport with uh, people is much more challenging. But once you develop that, you know, they are very welcome. But uh, again, and they will be interested in all the other aspects except giving the data that you are looking for. <laughs> they will tell stories. They will like, you know, uh, discuss every other thing that is happening. But uh, the moment is okay, let's discuss some work. <laughs> 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then you are alone again. You know, you have to really motivate them. So it's not actually really uh, just like you know, going there. I'm from Northeast, uh, but I don't look like a Northeast, yeah? right? So there's other suspect where I'm from. <laughs> Even though I work also in the university and uh, from the North Service, so there's other suspect. So there are many things actually that like, you know we have to face in the field. But again, like if we have, if you follow like the way uh, that like the thing that's related, if you follow the instructions and all, things become much more easier. And uh, the best like you know things that I learned over the years, you really have to earn the trust of the community people first. Otherwise, it's like very difficult then to start working with them. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Uh, since I heard this story about Narcist, and I can also don't look like uh, from Narcist to people. Easily, one can identify the man from different ways. I was conducting one uh, field work in Arunachal Pradesh uh, in shooting from India to shooting with Travel. And uh, we, along with my, one of my colleagues, uh, Visham Jin Bo, we conducted field work uh, on Sambal. And there was a dominant community, Adi was there. And one person, uh, he was not very friendly, and he created us. First, he could not identify his separately to the town. But I was easily, uh, to me, he easily identified that I am not from this place. Then he told that, why you are wasting So this whenever we are talking about language attitude, simply we are talking about the attitude of the country. Rarely we think about the attitude of the dominant community towards the endangered community. And this type of problem I faced several times in Arunachal, in Himachal, several places. And that the dominant community is not very, uh, means, uh, fond of each community and they don't think to make a kind of thing. Thank you. Scolding us. You people are coming and 
taking care of them, what will the use will cost? So many researchers, so many researchers going and collecting data. The acceptance it took almost one year for me to get their confidence on me. What I did is, whatever data I am analyzing, I Every time I used to, uh, officially I went to twice or thrice, but uh, unofficial I used to go with then it's Saturday, Sunday, and uh, I took printouts with color wrapper. So many, whenever I go, then they got some fun. Oh, this person is working, we are not, we are going to get something. Then only they started cooperation, giving data, and uh, accepted. So we have submitted, and maybe they are asking me, where is the dictionary, where is the dictionary. It is on the way, so Yada Dur Naya, then we call her me. So, next visit, I have to show publication to them. This is my situation. Okay, great point. They have to be always producing something that's like, you know, always giving us more about those places where you don't have access yet, or giving back, or showing them what to be done to be. I don't know, they listen to the radio podcast or something like that sort of thing. Yes, back in uh, Kolami, Gondi cases also, when Sabra rejected, but there a lot of rejection. Why? Preparing, we went for Twitter to prepare monthly religion, marathon education, primers. They started, you people want to study in English, study in our mother tongue. Go. If they start a lot of rejection like that. Once we snap something, some data, 10 pages, with their hamlet, their locality, their trees, their things, and printed it. And in next visit, we have, when we show uh, to them, then, okay, oh, this is my thing, it's my house, my street, my village, like that. Then slowly we enter the you got the daily Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for uh, giving a wonderful talk and language documentation to Dr. Sandy. Uh, I'm also very happy that you people are uh, interacting and involved in the discussion. This is what we are expecting from you people. As uh, sir already told in the inaugural session, just feel free to ask any questions, even if it is silly questions, you just ask. No one is perfect and we are learning, we are coming here for learning purposes only. So feel free any doubts. So we will try to answer if we know. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. And also I thank each and everyone. And now uh, that in IGA, please join us with us for lunch in IGA. Thank you very much. Uh, and then we'll uh, have a year at the 2 o'clock start.